Now, today I want to talk to you about bitterness and resentment. Bitterness and resentment is something that affects all of us. The truth is we are going to encounter things in life that are simply not fair. We cannot choose what happens to us. We can only choose how we respond. Can I get an amen? Oftentimes we respond the way our parents responded because they respond the way that their parents responded. And so it's very difficult in life to remain free of bitterness and envy and resentment and unforgiveness. And this is why we gather. This is why we listen to sermons like this to get wisdom from the word of God because whom the son sets free is free indeed. And so there's something about the timeline of this message that is so important for your life because I believe there are thresholds that God says, I do not want you to step over that threshold until I completely free you. There are times where he says that Egypt cannot follow you into the wilderness and I'll swallow up all the the, the chariots of Pharaoh so that you can get into this next season. I don't know who I'm talking to, but God will perform a miracle like he did for Moses to get you out of Egypt, but we must allow the waters to actually subdue and and eliminate the things that want to follow us into the next season. So there's many of you that have been tormented by things that 20 years ago, 15 years ago, and God wants to bring you into this new season, and yet you are being haunted and taunted by things from long ago. There's some of you that are bitter because of things that happened to you when you were three years old, four years old, five years old. Some of you have resentment from three churches ago. You, you, I am your third pastor, and you still hold resentment against the first one. Some of you are on your second marriage, still holding resentment against boyfriends and husbands. Some of you are, are, are living this life triggered and traumatized, and God wants to bring you to a place like this where he can heal you. By the end of this message, I want to make a promise to you that you are going to be released from PTSD, that you are going to get out of a fight or flight response. So you could be living your entire life looking over your shoulder. That's why David said, surely goodness and mercy has followed me all the days of my life because he was being stalked physically by Saul. But spiritually, he said, I'm being hunted down by goodness and mercy. So you have to be able to see in the spiritual realm. Otherwise, you'll live your entire life triggered. So here, let me do a recap, real quick recap. Go back and watch last week's message. It's already gone viral. I'm not exaggerating when I say I've received hundreds of reports of people experiencing deep inner healing as a result of it. So King David, living in obscurity as a poor shepherd boy, doesn't, his family doesn't even think enough of him to bring him out for the renowned prophet Samuel that had come to anoint the next king. But how many of you know that when God is going to promote you, no man can stop you because they didn't start you? Oh, come on. Somebody shout me down a little bit. When you are doing the right thing behind the scenes in secrecy, in obscurity, you become buoyant and they can hold you underwater, but they can't stop you from rising. There's something about faithfulness that provokes the blessing and provision and favor of God. And I'm going to just tell you, I don't get mad when they don't notice me because there's one who sees everything. And that is the one that I am living in response to. I don't care what you think. I know what he sees. And there's only a matter of time before the private becomes public, okay? Then all of a sudden he gets anointed. I just re-preached the whole sermon in 30 seconds. He gets anointed, but did you know that there is a time between when you are anointed and when you are appointed? You are never appointed the same day you are anointed. Okay, go back and watch that sermon. But David survives the process that produces the character to sustain the promise of that anointing. Many of you have not received your appointing even though you've received your anointing because there's more character development to be done so that you can sustain that which was promised by that anointing. So keep on going. Keep, that's, my, that's my commitment to you. I'll keep cheerleading you on. I'll keep preaching you silly every Sunday until you get there. But then he finally gets there Then David begins to have a family of his own. 
And he has sons from different mothers, which make them stepbrothers. He has daughters from different mothers, which make them stepmothers. And, and I know it looks like I'm on a stage, but can I just welcome you to my living room? Because a good church is not a church that has a stage, it's a church that has a living room. And so I'm inviting you, see you all, see we're one house with many rooms. We have rooms in Miami, rooms in Northwest Indiana, rooms in New York City, rooms on Long Island, but, but this is the living room. And so every Sunday, I, the, as a spiritual father, I invite all of you into our living room. Should I sit down to just help you figure it out? And so I wanna invite you to the living room because there are conversations that either never happen in a family or there's conversations that when they do happen, they happen the wrong way and ends up sp spreading more bitterness, more gossip, more criticism, more slander. But see, this is a different kind of conversation because it's centered around biblical wisdom. See, a good dad doesn't tell you what they think, they tell you what he thinks. And so I brought you to this place to tell you what God has to say about bitterness and resentment. This story that I'm gonna read to you is horrific, but I, I hate to say it's a story that's all too common today, and there's a high likelihood that it's happened to you as well. See, David now has his own family, and his own family is struggling. There's a lot of toxicity. There's a lot of dysfunction. I know that's hard to believe because in the coloring book version of Christianity that you got from Sunday school, you learned that David was a giant killer. But did you know that he knew how to go out and kill giants, but he couldn't slay problems in his own living room? Oh, come on, somebody. There's some toxicity happening right now. I know that there's some men watching right now that put their headset on and they jump into Fortnite, and they know how to take care of business. You understand Fortnite, but you still don't know how to hold down the fort. You make your boys happy in the game, but you can't make your wife happy in your home. See, I know I'm talking to somebody right now <laughs> that got real good at the controller, but feels like you don't have any control. I'm talking to somebody right now. I'm talking to somebody right now. We need this. This is David. David knows how to handle business outside his front door, but doesn't know how to deal with it in his living room. We gotta learn how to be successful in the living room. So now he's got some dysfunction. He doesn't know how to confront. Okay, let me go, let me go there. This is the 13th chapter of 2 Samuel. It says, in the course of time, Amnon, son of David, fell in love with Tamar, the beautiful sister of Absalom, son of David, for the theologians in the room, you recognized that this is a son of David falling in, falling in love with his sister. Sweet home Alabama. <laughs> Everybody watching in Alabama is like, really, Pastor Mike? I guess we're not getting a campus. So this is, this is it already starts off like, whoa, okay, let's, okay. Amnon became so obsessed with his sister Tamar that he himself made himself ill. She was a virgin and it seemed impossible for him to do anything to her. Well, yeah, it is impossible. You shouldn't sleep with your sister. Let me just tell you, I think it's important to stop right here and acknowledge that sin always leads to obsession. And before sin is received, it is conceived. You must birth it in your mind before you ever manifest it in reality. Sin always turns into obsession. And so he begins to look at his sister and he wants something that he shouldn't have. You gotta learn how to deal with sin before it becomes obsession. Because the longer you entertain it, the more you feed it, and whatever you feed thrives, and whatever you starve dies. People are saying, like, I have a lust problem. No, you don't. You have an obsession problem. Because the more you feed it, the more it thrives. But as you begin to starve lust, it actually begins to die. And so the things in our life that live are the things that we feed. Come on, am I helping somebody already? Am I helping anybody already? So what happens is David cannot teach Amnon how to receive a victory he never learned how to receive. See, Dave, oh, come on. 
David already fell and slept with Bathsheba, who was somebody else's wife. So dad has a lust problem and his firstborn son Amnon now has a lust problem. What you don't confront and what you don't conquer, you transmit to the next generation. The inheritance that you all leave is the sin that you did not conquer through the blood of Jesus Christ. Some of you are worried about passing money, but you're passing sin that you have not confronted through the blood of Jesus Christ. Oh, I hope I give my kids a house. You gave them lust, homie. Deal with it. You gave them a house, but you never taught them how to build a home. I'm trying to help somebody. Amnon, the oldest son of David, is obsessing. Watch, first David actually sins after Bathsheba, somebody else's wife, but now the sin of lust in his firstborn son is for his own sister, which means sin gets more perverse through the generations. Y'all are gonna have to talk back to me today because you're being way too quiet. It started as adultery in the second generation. What is it? Incest. Oh, I just have a porn problem. Yeah, but what's it gonna be in your children's generation? I love you too much not to tell you what pastors have never said before. It, sin multiplies through generations. Then Amnon, through his obsession, begins to strategize because sin always strategizes. Now Amnon had an advisor named Jonadab, son of Shimea, David's brother. This is his uncle. Man, some of you are thinking, my family's looking way healthier than I thought it was. So his uncle now begins to advise him. And uncle says, you know, why do you, the king's son, look so haggard morning after morning? morning? Won't you tell me? And then Amnon said to him, well, I'm in love with Tamar, my brother Absalom's sister. Okay, that's the moment where if you're the uncle, you backhand your nephew. You understand? But dysfunction will always have you doing a perverted form of helping. Oh, let's go to the garage and let's drink. Come here, I know you're going through a hard time. Let's go, hey, come on, let me take you out to the bar. See, what, what happens in toxic families is you receive a perverted form of help. Some of you, the first drink you ever took was from a family member who thought they were helping you. Oh, come on, somebody. You know the stories I've heard of fathers literally taking their own sons to prostitutes to say, I'm gonna help you learn how to be with a woman. See, toxic families give you a perverted form of help. Very rarely does it come fully exposed as evil, but rather another version of good. See, Satan says, I'll come as an angel of light. I know they won't receive me if they see me in my true form, but I'll come as an angel of light and say, oh, you're feeling anxiety? Go ahead and smoke a little bit of this. And see, some, sometimes it's your own family members who actually give you a prefer, perverted form of help. That's why the Bible says God has not given you the spirit of fear. Why? Because fear is not a feeling, it's a spirit. And so, so you're, trying to, you're trying to toke your way past a feeling when you need deliverance from a spirit. But your family didn't teach you deliverance, they taught you dope. <laughs> See, I'm trying to help somebody today. Family, so this is what he says. Amnon said, and well, I'm in love with her. And then this is what the advisor, this is what uncle says, go to bed and pretend to be ill. Jonadab said, when your father comes to see you, say to him, I, will be, I, I would like my sister Tamar to come and give me something to eat. Let her prepare the food in my sight that I may watch her and then eat it from her hand. I think about the time that his dad, David, pretended to be mentally ill. See, there's a, lot, there's a lot of things that are being transferred generationally. See, there's a repetition of deception. You'll see it. So Amnon laid down and pretended to be sick. When the, king came to, when the king came to see him, Amnon said to him, I would like my sister Tamar to come and make some special bread in my sight so I can eat from her hand. And then David, the dad, not knowing what's going on, not knowing the strategy that's happening right under his nose, sent word for Tamar at the palace. Go to the house of your brother <coughs> and prepare some food for him. So Tamar went to the house of her brother Amnon, who was laying down. She took some dough, kneaded it, made the bread in, the, in his side and baked it. 
Then all of a sudden, Amnon says, take everyone away. So everyone left, and then Amnon said to Tamar, bring the food here into my bedroom so I may eat from your hand. Did you know that home should be a safe place? But often home is the very place we are damaged the most. It's right there in Amnon's home, in his bedroom, a place for sleeping becomes the place of nightmares. For many of you, if I were to ask you, where did it happen? It happened at home. It's why the devil hates family. It's why the devil hates legacy. If you were to ask me, what is the principal goal of all demons? I would tell you it's to destroy inheritance. And if he can't destroy it, he'll pervert it and get you to pass the wrong thing. This is primarily the work of the devil. So then as you begin to see this, David sent word to Tamar and he goes, they show up. Then all of a sudden that everybody leaves except for Tamar. And then all of a sudden she begins to get close in proximity, thinking she's helping her stepbrother. And then all of a sudden says, no, my brother, we can't do this because she, he, he grabs her hand. Don't force me, she says. Such a thing should not be done in Israel. Don't do this wicked thing. What about me? How many times has this kind of sin happened and somebody said, don't do it. I know I shouldn't do it. How many times have, have we even gone to sin and there's multiple times when we say there's still time to turn away, there's still time to stop, but we go through it anyways because we're fulfilling the desire of the obsession. You see that happening. Tamar has her hand now drawn closer by Amnon and she's saying, please, this will be a disgrace. She's trying to find a way out. I think about the scripture that says, in every temptation, we always have a way out. And then all of a sudden, please speak to the king. He will not keep me from being married to you. But he refused to listen to her. And since he was stronger than her, he raped her. Then Amnon hated her with intense hatred. In fact, he hated her more than he had loved her. Amnon said to her, get up and get out. No, she said to him, sending me away would be a greater wrong than what you have already done to me. But he refused to listen to her. He called his personal servant and said, get this woman, wouldn't even use her name. See, victimizers always dehumanize. Get this woman. See, what happens is when you fulfill the desire of your obsession, you will take the hate that you feel for yourself and you will pass it to the person you did it to. See, he felt disgusted with himself, so he transferred the disgust to her and treated her in a way, send this woman away from me. And, and here's the other thing. You see her trying to marry her stepbrother in that moment. Why? Because they have formed a toxic codependency. And she's saying, I shouldn't be in this situation, but if I am gonna be in this situation, at least may, let me make the best of a bad situation. I don't know who I'm talking to right now, but there are times when you will actually have stock home syndrome where you will begin to identify with the person keeping you captive and instead of leaving that place you'll try to make it work when you shouldn't even try to make it work I don't know how many people I talk to where I tell them you should have left that relationship a long time ago that person is calling you that woman not your wife you need to get out that person is calling you that woman not a daughter of your house at that church you cannot be toxically codependent to that which resulted from somebody fulfilling their obsession for a desire, not their compassion for a person. Lust is obsession for a desire. Marriage is a compassion that produces covenant. Most church attendance is that pastor's obsession with their ego to feel a need of significance by virtue of growing their church and you become the object of their obsession, not the product of their covenant. Who am I talking to right now? It's getting real quiet in the room. And some of us who have attended, we have attended Amnon's church. We've been married to Amnon. Oh, I'm speaking to somebody right now. I'm going there right now. But then what begins to happen? Can, I go, can this preacher go a little deeper? 
Then what begins to happen after she's raped? Then Amnon hated her, sends her away. Now watch, watch, go to verse 20. Her brother Absalom said to her, has that Amnon, your brother? See, he didn't even say our brother. He said yours. Did your father do this to you? Did that guy, you see how sometimes even our language reveals the root of bitterness? See, oh, you, you, won't, you won't even claim that person. See the language? If you pay attention to the scriptures, everything is in there as revelation for your freedom. Because he says, has, has your brother been with you? Be quiet for now, my sister. He is your brother. Don't take this thing to heart. Now Absalom comes into the picture and Absalom says, hey, 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 was something wrong done to you? I'll be there for you. The spirit of Absalom all, always provides perverted protection. Oh, oh, is Pastor Mike hurting you? Oh, I'll be there for you. I'll protect you from Pastor Mike. Oh, is your husband hurting you? Oh, I'll protect you from your husband. Oh, is your wife, oh, she's abusive? Oh, but I under, you know how many times people start infidelities, not out of a sexual reason, but out of a psychological reason because the person comes as a false form of protection. Some of you have a porn problem. Some of you have a protection problem. Oh, no, no, they don't understand you. I understand you. They're not there for you. I Be careful of those who offer their protection because often it's a sign of their obsession. Be careful. Be careful for those with an extended hand because Amnon will grab you to rape you and they'll grab you to use you. Be careful. Be careful. Be careful. Everybody's got a motive. You know what I like about New York, New York City residents? Because I am one now. <laughs> By blood now. <laughs> the New Yorkers think that's funny. Is we can smell people's motives. We know. We know. You, you'll go visit their church and they're like, welcome home. You're like, uh, 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 not here. Holy Ghost already told me no when I walked in. I don't know why I'm still here. You know what I'm saying? New, New Yorkers, you'll, go, you'll show up, you're like, ah, ah, ah. <laughs> okay, let's get back to the text. So all of a sudden, Absalom extends his protection. Sister, come live with me. Now watch. He moves his sister into his home. And she serves as a constant reminder of the sin of his stepbrother. Some of you don't have a problem until you move somebody else's problem into your home. Oh, I'm speaking. Some of you don't have a problem until you move somebody else's problem in your home. The fact is, this happened between Tamar and Amnon, and maybe it involves David as the dad. Who it didn't involve was Absalom, but Absalom got himself involved. See, some of you here are dealing with what happened to you, and some of you are dealing with bitterness by virtue of what happened through you. It happened through somebody else. It was, they did my mom like that, I'll kill him. They did my aunt like that, I'll kill him. I did that. If you've uttered those words, you have a deep root of bitterness, and the only person experiencing death is not your enemy. It's the death of your purpose. It's the death of your destiny. It's the death of your peace. You ain't killing nobody but yourself, homie. Hypertension's killing you. Diabetes is about to kill you. Come on, GI tract intestinal issues are about to kill you because when you don't deal with bitterness the right way, bitterness always deals with you. And so Absalom has somebody else's problem living in his house. Some of you actually do make enough money for your own family, it's everybody else that you're always trying to provide for. It's everybody else you're trying to help. Some of you do have enough strength 
for your own problems. It's you taking on everybody else's problems that wears you out. Some of you don't know how strong you could really be if you actually concern yourself with only yourself. Some of you don't know what it's like to release a burden because you grew up too fast. You became a parent before your time and you were an adult when you should have been a child. So you're traumatized, triggered. You're in a PTSD cycle and you live the rest of your life trying to do everyone else's life for them. And it's only going to destroy you. And I've come with a message. The message I come with is in order to get into this kingdom, you must go back and become like a child again. To get into this kingdom, you must learn who the real parent is. And it's my heavenly father. He says, my yoke is easy. My burden is light. Why don't we make an exchange? You might not have had your first childhood, but I'm here to call you to be born again. And you'll have another childhood. And instead of having to be somebody else's something, let me be your everything. Hallelujah. Somebody shout unto God. Absalom could have done it differently. Now, I got to show you something about your David, the one that you love so much. Your David, the giant kill. Your David who wrote all the Psalms that are your favorite Psalms. Well, now that David's a dad, he doesn't understand how to confront and the areas that need the most confront. Can I just tell you, under the anointing of God, it's easier to kill a giant than it is to confront your own son. You know, under the anointing of God, it's easier to preach on this platform than it is to reconcile with my own wife. This is why pastors end up winning in the areas that matter least and failing in the areas that matter most. The anointing of God comes on you. You know, when I pray for people and they get healed, you know that's easy because I'm not the healer he is. But see, when God says, I'm not asking you to be the healer, I'm asking you to be the reconciler. And healing is a lot easier than reconciliation when someone else is doing the healing. Am I preaching too deep or are you following me? So David now, watch, watch, watch. David shows up. When King David heard all of this, he was furious And Absalom never said a word to Amnon, either good or bad. He hated Amnon because he had disgraced his sister Tamar. I read this multiple times this week, saying, God, please show me that David did something other than got angry about it. And you will not find any actions on the part of David. What that means is David was angered, but he didn't know what to do with his anger. Can I just tell you that as a result of David's inactivity, he created the conditions where Absalom felt like if David's not going to do something, if dad isn't going to do something, I'll do something. And then he took it in his own hands. Can I tell you that it is a sin to not let God be the vindicator? It is a, and why do I say that? Because you will manipulate, you will control, you will get into forms of Christian witchcraft when you don't trust that God's gonna work it out and that you have to use your words and your fake prophecies and your arguments to make something happen that God could have made happen if you got out of his way. Come on, I know I'm trying to speak to something right now, but see, Absalom took up this problem and he didn't trust God and he didn't trust God's delegated authority, which was his dad. David learned that lesson. When man fails, God never fails. If God said I was gonna be a king, that's between God and me, and I'm gonna stay faithful until it happens and he'll do whatever he's got to do. But, but see, in this situation, Absalom said, I have to take it in my own hands because God's delegated authority isn't gonna deal with it, and then God's not gonna deal with it. I'm gonna have to deal with it. There's many of you in this place that are carrying heavy burdens. Some of you can feel it in your stomach while I'm talking. The whole time I've been preaching, you've been feeling like, am I gonna throw up? Yes, you're about to get a bitter root out of you today. It's coming out because you're gonna be relieved of assignments God never assigned you. You're gonna be relieved. Oh, I felt that in the spirit. You are not gonna be an Absalom. Do you know how many churches split because somebody rises up and says, well, if this lead pastor is not gonna to do it right, I'll do it right. But the question becomes, were you anointed for that assignment? Because if you are not anointed for that assignment, you always will be destroyed by your attempt to fulfill it. 
See, this is why it's very important that you understand out of the 10 commandments, one of them is honor your mother and your father. Why? Because they serve as the first lesson of how to interact with authority. They serve as the first lesson of how to trust God above them. So when you dishonor your mother and father, listen, you dishonor God who chose them for you. And some of you are like, what? He chose an alcoholic for me? What, he chose a cheater for me? What, he chose an adulterer? Oh yeah, because even a bad example will teach you what not to do. Some of you will become a good father because in his infinite sovereign wisdom, he gave you a bad one. And so you honor your father, not because your biological father was good, but because your heavenly father knew that by giving you that father, it would produce in you the fortitude needed to ensure that in your generation, you will stand up and be what God called you to be and be a generational bloodline curse breaker and show everybody else how to be the real thing too. God knew. So when you honor your parents, you honor the one who gave you your parents that you could not choose. So there's something about authority. And in a lawless generation, we dishonor our lead pastor. We dishonor our biological mother. We dishonor, but we don't understand that God is in control. And you will become at threat of turning into an Absalom. No, 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 no. Listen to me, wives. Listen to me, wives. Stop trying to lead your husband. And when you get out of the way, maybe the Holy Spirit will start to lead your husband because the Holy Spirit's not in the business of competing with you. Matter of fact, he ascended like a dove, not as a dove, like a dove, because it was the only verbiage that could be used to explain how gentle he is. And so when you try to be aggressive with your husband, but the Holy Spirit's trying to be gentle with your husband, your aggression is causing his suppression. You've got to sometimes allow the Holy Spirit to do his thing. And what happens is this Absalom spirit. Can I just tell you, it's a spirit that never confronts the right way. So let me tell you, David never confronted his son Amnon. David never, he never even went to Tamar to try to help her. But Absalom also never directly confronted either. So a root of bitterness is a root of isolation, is a root of loneliness. It's a root that says, I'll never talk to them. I don't care. I'm not talking to them this Christmas. I'm not talking to them on Thanksgiving. I'm not, I don't need to talk. I don't need to talk to nobody. I'm just going to go. And some of you think that distance produces deliverance. Some of you think, however far I can get away from my family, the further I get away, the healthier it becomes. The only problem is the bitter roots on the inside of you. And so distance doesn't produce deliverance because you cannot outrun that which is already inside of you. You have to get this bitter root out. And some of you think if they died, then I'll feel better but death doesn't produce deliverance. Actually, what you'll find is they'll die. Then you'll realize you'll never have the confirmation. You'll never have the conversation. And as a result, you're tormented. Can I just tell you, if you go to read the 15th chapter, the very next chapter, you literally see Absalom call for the death of Amnon and somebody else carries it out. Whoa, wait a second. You mean just like how David had other people carry out the murder of Bathsheba's husband? Yes, a generational curse of murder has now been passed to Absalom. And that leads me to a major point of this message. The devil's goal is to get you to to the same destination of your dad through a different route. Some of you are like, I'll never drink like my dad drank. And you'll find yourself an alcoholic for a different reason than your dad became an alcoholic. Some of you think you can outrun a curse, but you can't. You must confront the curse with the blood of Jesus. You must stand and fight that thing directly head on. Some of you are like, oh, I'll never be a cheater like my, my, my mom was a cheater. But you'll find yourself of cheating and you'll do it for a different reason than your mom did it to your dad. The devil wants to get you to the same destination through a different route. You know GPS, when you start taking a different route, 
it'll say rerouting, rerouting, rerouting. The devil has a destination in your life. It's to kill, to steal, and destroy. And every single time you're on that path of righteousness, he will try to get you to reroute, to get you to the same destination of your forefathers. Did you know when I studied Absalom's lineage? Because I thought to myself, well, surely Absalom is also the son of Bathsheba, just like, uh, you know, uh, Solomon was the son of Bathsheba. So David and Bathsheba had children, but no. Absalom has a different mother. Matter of fact, Absalom's mother is the daughter of the king of Bashan. And if you ask yourself, why would a king offer up his daughter literally to sleep with David, the king of Israel? It's often because in ancient times, it would be an offering that was given to a neighboring king to say, let's keep peace. So watch this, Absalom's mother wasn't given to David for love, but for strategy. David himself became a strategist in another season where he said, well, let me go get Bathsheba and I can arrange for her husband to be murdered and I cover this whole thing up. So watch this, Absalom's dad is a strategist, but Absalom's grandfather is a strategist too. So then all of a sudden in his generation, who does Absalom become? A strategist without love and without compassion, willing to destroy anyone that gets in the way of his desire to be king. See, some of you don't even realize these things that are in you run deep. They run through your grandfather's side. They run through your father's side. It's in you deep and you don't even realize it. And if I could go back, and rewrite the story that's in here and tell it to you another way. Maybe what that looks like is Absalom hearing that his sister's been raped and then grabbing Tamar's hand and saying, Tamar, let me tell you about the loving kindness of God. This shouldn't have happened to you, Tamar. You never should have been raped. But let me tell you, if you don't forgive your brother, it's gonna destroy you, Tamar. I know life didn't work out the way you wanted it to work out, but God is a righteous God of justice and vengeance, and your brother's not gonna get away with anything. God's always a God of justice, and re- but he gave her a false form of help in the form of his own protection. Some of you have led your family to you. It's time to lead them to him. Come on, I'm talking to somebody right now. I'm talking to somebody right now. Here's another way it could have gone. David gets confronted by Absalom. This never happens in scripture. I mean, Absalom hates his dad, David. David is unwilling to have the hard conversations. So guess what begins to occur? Bitterness grows because whenever you defer the confrontation, you multiply the bitterness. There's no way around it. What would have happened if Absalom said, Dad, I need to have a hard talk with you? Then all of a sudden they sit down. Yes, what it is it, son? I'm so mad at you, Dad. Why did you not do anything about Tamar being raped? Why did you, how how could you be this giant killer, this famous warrior, but in our own home, you don't know how to slap down your own son? What's wrong with you, Dad? And then all of a sudden, David, what if he would have said, I don't know. It's easy to come up under the anointing to do great things for God, but I never developed the character that caused me to win in the living room. What do you think we should do about, see how there were multiple opportunities for anyone to make a decision differently and it would have produced freedom in every direction. Do you see what I'm saying? But watch this. When I look at the word of God says, and this is so profound in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 15, see to it that no one fails to obtain the grace of God that no root of bitterness would spring up because by it, many will be defiled. Can I just tell you, when you have a bitter root, everybody around you eats the fruit of it. Would you stand to your feet across every location right now? If you're watching this, just stay with me because I believe the greatest moment of freedom is right around the corner for you. 
What was done to you was wrong, but it was done by people who were wounded, who were hurt and made foolish decisions. And no, that's not dismissing. Some, some people are like, are you dismissing their sin? I'm not dismissing their sin, even though I'm explaining it. There was something wrong. If I go back to Tamar and Amnon, he should have never slept with his sister but he did not have trust in God that God would righteously fulfill his sexual desires. And so some of you heard this story and said, I would never sleep with, sleep with my sister, but I tell you the word of the Lord, you slept with someone else's sister. Come on, this is a stern rebuke. Oh, I would never do that to my own sister. You did it to someone else's daughter. You did it to someone else's sister. Sin is something that we always accuse somebody else for, but excuse in ourselves. It says, let the grace of God come to you that the root of bitterness does not defile everyone around you. Some of you are like, I'll never do what that pastor did. And the Lord says, yeah. You've done worse as you've led everybody around you through your life. Does that excuse that pastor? Does it excuse the rapist? No, no, of course not. But what it does do is it enters, it allows grace to enter your heart right now. Because in allowing grace to enter your heart, you begin to say, God, we need you. We need you, that bitter root Proverbs chapter 4 verse 23 says, keep your heart with all vigilance for from your heart flows a spring of life. You want to know why we have all kinds of road rage right now in our streets? Because it's easier for somebody to cut you off than it is to confront their own family members. And your, their road rage is rage that they place in the road because they don't know how to deal with it at home. They take it out on you because they don't know how to talk about it with them. That's road rage. Road rage is let me take all of the rage I'm feeling and deal with it here because I don't know how to deal with it in the living room. See, do, do you wanna know why our comment sections and so many comment sections are filled with so much bitter guile and filled with so much harsh reality and people, it's not intellectualism because Proverbs chapter four, verse 23 says, keep your heart with all vigilance for from your heart flows the spring of life. It might get filtered through your mind but the source is your heart. And so that bitterness, even though it masks itself in comment sections as intellectualism, it is hurting people, not revealing how smart they are, but revealing how wounded and traumatized they are. And so what happens is we receive their argument as intellectual when in fact it's emotional. This is why churches are divided. This is why homes are divided because you have your reasons, but you don't have your healings. We need healing more than we need reasons. Oh yeah, 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 I'm right, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. You're right, but you're not healed. So God wants to deal with this right now, this bitter root. Did you know that as the story continues, Absalom eventually creates a situation where he turns David's men against him, tries to take the entire kingdom and steal it for himself. And then he goes into the woods. And then while he's in the woods, David sends his mighty men to confront his own son. And David says, be gentle with my son. Why? Because David knows that rebellion is an irrevocable response or will irrevocably be responded by from God with being silenced, being removed. Rebellion never leads to anything healthy. A church started out of rebellion will never become a healthy church. A ministry launched out of rebellion. A marriage started out of rebellion. There has to be a reconciliation where there was rebellion. There has to be a repentance where there's rebellion. Some of you don't even realize right now that the Lord is speaking into some deep things in your life. But here's what happens. The reason why you did it wasn't right, but two wrongs don't make a right. Do y'all hear me? Two wrongs don't make a right. And so here's the thing, some of you, the person who molested you is dead now. You don't feel any better now, do you? Some of you, the person who hurt you, who abandoned you, who walked out on you is dead and gone and yet you don't feel any better. 
Did you know that even after, after Absalom killed Amnon, he didn't feel satiated. He went to his next target. And you know what it was? David, his dad. See, what happens is you'll move from target to target. The Bible doesn't say that a Christian should go from target to target. We should be going from glory to glory. Do you all hear me? From glory to glory. And some of you are like, why is my life not getting better? It's because you're bitter. How could I be sweet? Let me tell you how. Come on, let me grab this communion. This is day seven. We're gonna do it right now. This is day seven of seven. I want everybody to grab their communion. If you're watching from home, I want you to grab something to take communion right now because PTSD, trauma, is going to leave your physical body. Some of you are going to begin to feel that your body shifts out of tra a trauma response. Some of you are in a fight or flight response. You're always looking over your shoulder. You're always scared. And the Lord says, after you take communion today, you are not going to live in a flight or res fight response anymore. Come on, let's get this communion going at every location. Take the wafer in one hand, take the cup in the other hand. You know what I realized in my journey with Jesus is that I was always engaged in fights, always fighting somebody, arguing with somebody. Always somebody had it out for me. Then I realized, wait a second, the way that I'm living my life is producing these fights. Of course, not everybody's for me, but I'm living in a trauma response and biasing my reality towards conflict. Everybody look at me while I say this. What if I told you that you are in the right church, even though your trauma won't let you believe it? What if I told you, even if you're not in a perfect marriage, what if I told you you are in the right marriage, even though your trauma won't let you believe it? See, when you look at life through the eyes of trauma, it won't ever let you be happy. It won't ever let you experience joy. Trauma forces you to focus on the wrong thing. You focus on what was done wrong instead of focusing on forgiveness, focusing on grace. Trauma always changes your focus. And the Lord wants to release you from that. It's in your body. Do you know how many women that I've taken through communion and they've had PCOS and, and literally even, even within their, their, their female organs, they've had cysts, tumors, and you go back to the origin of it, it's some sort of traumatic event that happened to them. I believe that there, we have shifted from a church from deliverance to inner healing right now. And there's many of you, the demons are gone, but the nest has to go too. Because sometimes you can actually remove the rat, but if you don't remove the rat's nest, you'll get a new rat in an old nest. And some of you, these issues you're having in your physical body are the nests left behind by the rats that tormented you from year, for years and you've received deliverance from demons but never dismantled the nest. And communion, communion is when you experience healing, deliverance, freedom on a whole nother level. Why? Because just like that bitter root went on the inside of you, the blood of Jesus and the body of Christ is gonna go on the inside of you right now. I know there's somebody right now and their spirit is screaming, I can't forgive my dad, not for what he did. I hate him. Don't you dare sound like the devil. Just because you were discipled by the devil doesn't mean that you can't be disciplined by your heavenly father and start speaking like Jesus right now in this moment. What your dad did was wrong. What he did to you and your family was wrong. But I'm telling you, don't allow Satan to get you to the same destination by a different route. He will end up destroying you for a different reason than he destroyed your dad. You have to break free. There's some of you are saying, oh, that person that did me wrong, I'll never let him go. That's the root of bitterness talking you let them go saying God I'm giving them to you I'm not going to lean on my own understanding but in all my ways I'm going to acknowledge you and you will direct my path come on somebody God wants to lift you up higher but the bitter root has to come out you cannot live easily offended you cannot live always triggered 
You must say, God, I believe that you are in control and I'm not going from trigger to trigger, from target to target. I will go from glory to glory and nothing's going to hold back my freedom, not even me. Somebody believe it. David could conquer the the Goliath in front of him, but never conquer the giant on the inside of him. And that's many of you right now. But the Holy Spirit is about to help you. I see many people crying through this sermon because the Lord doesn't want you crossing over this threshold, not being healed. So I want you to hold this. Did you know that the Bible says that if you take communion, but you have not confessed your sins, that this will actually turn into poison when it enters your body. There's actually very strict instructions given to communion because the significance of it is if you're asking your father to forgive you yet you're holding unforgiveness against them this turns to poison when it enters you so what we're going to do right now is one of the most powerful moments you may have ever experienced in your life and some of you your father and your grandfather your mother your grandmother generations before you never experienced this they never did this but it stops with you it stops with you and you know what it comes down to trust in god god where were you when i was molested god where were you when i was raped god where were you when i was abandoned god where were you when they walked out god where were you when we were cold god where were you when we were hungry god where were you when that pastor hurt me god where were you you know what he's saying to you i'm here right now i never ever desired that they would do that to you but i will take what the devil meant for harm and turn it around for your good That's the promise that we have. That's the promise that we have. Now listen, last thing. In life, the bitter root comes out when you realize the only villain is Satan and his demons. And the only hero is Jesus Christ. The hero is not the person that, or that, 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 that you're not the hero for helping and they're not the villo, a villain for doing it. The hero is Jesus Christ. So when you look and you say, you know what? They weren't the victim, they were victimized. <laughs> victimized by demons that perverted and distorted their mind. They're they're not they're not the hero. I'm not the hero even though they helped. Jesus is the only one that can truly help because when he heals, it's a healing that is forever. When he restores, it's a restoration that's irrevocable. When he redeems, he sets all things new. And many of you are about to take this communion and leave an inheritance to your family of healing and wholeness and peace and long suffering. Come on, the fruit of the spirit, not the fruit of the wound, not the fruit of bitterness but the fruit of the spirit will be your legacy to your family you will say i know what it is to experience peace and kindness and gentleness and loving kindness in a way that i've never known it apart from jesus prayer team can i have you come up at every location and just get ready cuz the lord's dealing with some things church i want you to do this take the cup take the bread this represents his his body And as we take it now If your body was wounded you take his body for your healing If your body was inappropriately touched If you're if if a man laid his hands on you and squeezed you and pushed you down and punched you if maybe you're a man and you're the victim of domestic violence it happens both ways even in your body you carry that pain you carry that trauma when you just took the body of Christ right now and ingested his body i believe that it is for the healing of your body even some of you are beginning to release that trauma and that pain in your physical body right now under the sound of my voice where you are grabbed some of you had your hair pulled some of you are pinched some of you are bruised some of you have broken ribs but right now as you ingested the bread the body of Christ it goes into your body for your healing he was bruised for your iniquities come on The Lord's healing right now. Now I want you to take this cup which represents his blood. 
This is our seventh day taking communion together. And as you took the blood of Christ, what, be, what began to happen is the blood went on the inside of you and it ransomed you and it began to call you forth as family. And some of you are like, how could I ever be made completely whole? As soon as you took the blood of Jesus, you are being made whole right now. Right now, it's happening on the inside of you. There are many people across every location that deeply need healing. If you're here and you've been going through the, the entire time I'm preaching, you feel that bitter root, would you just come out of your seat and come up to receive prayer right now? And, I, and the reason why I'm doing this boldly is because sometimes we need to learn to confront. Yeah, come on, they're coming out of their seat right now. Sometimes we need to learn how to confront. Your mother, your father, they never had the confrontation. And sometimes you need to come up and you need to say, I need to just leave this at the altar. And, and it might be multiple people at every location that say, I have been struggling with this bitter root. Yeah, come on. There's people getting hugs right now at the altar that desperately needed a hug, that desperately needed an embrace. I know that this wasn't the most shouting sermon I've ever preached, but the Lord told me, Mike, do surgery. Go in and cut those things out. Yeah, come on. Some of you today, the chains are being broken off your hands. Come on, I wanna prophesy over our entire church for a few moments before we begin to sing. And many are coming up. There's a huge line for prayer at every location right now. So can you just, if you're a campus pastor, a service pastor, let's all join the prayer team to pray for as many people as possible because bitter roots are coming out right now. Bitter roots are coming out right now. So I'm gonna prophesy and just give a word of knowledge over multiple people. I see the Lord healing trauma and triggers. There's people that the sound of certain things trigger them. The sight triggers them. There's some of you that have been dealing with this and it's like constant. And the Lord just told me right now, as soon as you begin to take communion, as you begin to pray, the Lord just begin to relieve you of it. And he's removing the effects of it. There's some of you that said, I, I, I know it's gonna sound crazy, but clear as day, the Lord said, there's somebody who said, I'll never get married again and you made an inner vow, but the Lord's beginning to soften your heart. And because you're being healed from the trauma of the previous marriage, that you're opening yourself up and, and you will marry again. And this is a confirmation. There's also a bitter root against God. Clear as day, the Lord just said, some of them are bitter against me and they need to say, I forgive. Lord, I release you. Forgive me for holding bitterness against you. Specifically, there's somebody who's, who's had multiple miscarriages and there's a bitter root of miscarriage and you've even begun to be mad at God and God is saying, release that, release that, release that, release that, release that, even that bitter, that bitter wound. Some of you are bitter. I know this is gonna sound crazy, but I'm going even deeper because we have a line all the way out the door for prayer right now. This, this sermon has dealt with some, some things that I believe have never been dealt with in families before. But I, but I hear the Lord saying, some of you, there's a root of bitterness and it's even unforgiveness to yourself. You said, I'll never forgive myself for making these mistakes. I'll never forgive myself for, for the thing I've done. And that bitter root on the inside of you is a root that needs to come out right now. And the Lord says, I'm gonna cause you to see yourself how I see you. I'm gonna cause you to love yourself with the love that I've given you. I'm gonna turn that thing around right now. Yeah, come on. Let me just continue to minister over our entire church while people are receiving prayer right now the bitter root, resentment. I hear the Lord saying, I wanna deal with resentment in you. Resentment. Sometimes you resent other people. You compete with other people. You're jealous of other people. Some of you are jealous of family members and the Lord says, I wanna bless you, but I can't bless you until jealousy is removed. 
I want to increase you, but I cannot increase you until competition is removed. Because what will happen is you'll have the blessing, but it'll, it won't be a blessing. You'll have the title, you'll have the prestige, but it won't feel like a blessing because you'll still be dealing with that thing, that bitter root. And so many of you right now need to begin to say, God, bring this thing out of me. All jealousy, all competition, all rage, all anger. Heal me, God. Heal me of this. Are there any Gen Z that have school bullies that they need to be free? School bullies. I felt the anointing on that real right now. Gen Z, the younger generation, bullies from school come up and receive prayer right now because that root of bitterness will go in and you'll live your life in response to bitterness and what you call success will actually be the fruit of bitterness because you did these things to show them and to prove a point to them instead of living in response to God's voice you'll live in response to the voice of the bully and you're trying to prove something I don't know who I'm talking to but there's multiple people that you have tried to prove something to somebody and the Lord says you have become a people pleaser even to try to please to try to live in response to someone else's voice but live in response to my voice live in response to what I say says the Lord live in response to what I say says the Lord some of you are still trying to prove something to some somebody who hurts you and God says show me live in response to me don't live in response to the pain I, come on, I'm going to keep ministering the whole church right now. If you're a V1 staff member, if you're available to pray for people, just pray for them. We, we still got a huge line of prayer. But I believe that before the new year is over, that we are not stepping into 2024 with a bitter root. We are promotable. We can be promoted by God. We can be lifted up by God. We can be blessed by God. We're saying, I'm not crossing that threshold with this wound anymore. Come on, somebody. Pluck that bitter root out of your belly by the power of Jesus Christ. Refuse to live wounded. He was healed for our bruise for our transgression. We are healed because of his blood. I want to do something as we get ready to come to a close. We're going to leave the altars open at every location. We got a good 10 minutes till the next service starts. Let people in if we have room to let them in. Let them, exchange, you know, go get their kids from V1 Kids. We'll, we'll change over here in a few, but the Lord told me, He said, Mike, as a spiritual father, deal with those roots. There's mothers literally holding their babies, receiving freedom right now because it will not pass to the next generation. Come on, this church is different. This church is different, y'all. This church is different. We're going to get free in this house. We're going to have the hard conversations. Come on, in this... In this living room, you get healed in this living room. Come on, you were wounded in your old living room. There's healing in this living room. I feel the power of God starting to come down in overtime right now. Come on, this is different. The, the other church hurt you, but a new church will heal you. One pastor hurt you, another pastor will heal you. The first Adam falls, the second Adam redeems. Come on, God will always cause it to happen in the same place where it happened. I feel the power of God here in New York City. I feel it surging into Long Island. I feel it surging into Miami. I feel it surging into Northwest Indiana. I feel it surging into, into Bakersfield, California, Hawaii. I just got a vision of Hawaii. Something ancestral is being broken off in Hawaii right now. Ancestral witchcraft is being broken off because they made a covenant. Some of you in this room right now, some of you watching by way of broadcast, I hear the Lord saying that somebody in your bloodline 
would try to manipulate a situation and they used witchcraft to do it. And as they used witchcraft to manipulate it, there was a curse of witchcraft in your bloodline. They wanted to make people fall in love. They wanted to try to make something happen. But I hear the Lord say, I'm breaking the curse of witchcraft because you've submitted under my mighty hand. You will be free right now in the name of Jesus. And the curse is broken. Wow. Y'all, I have never seen this level of freedom and inner healing. It's different. It's different. I'm going to keep prophesying a little bit longer. I know service went long, but this is, I, I mean, if you could see, come on, bring that, bring the roaming camera over here. I want to show them. Bring the roaming camera. Let me tell you, this is inner healing that's happening. The, the, the rats are gone, but the nests are getting ready to be removed today. That's what's happening. That's why there's lines all the way out. Yeah, bring me the roaming up on stage. And then I want to show them what I see because the Lord's moving powerfully right now. Now, yo, we're going to keep going. People are receiving prayer. I want to say something over everybody as they're receiving prayer though. I heard the Lord say, you will be the best of what I destined your biological father to be. You will be the best of what I destined your biological mother to be. You will live out the purpose they were supposed to live out. You will live out the attributes that they were supposed to live out that bring me glory, says the Lord. And the best of what your dad stood for, the best of what he was supposed to be, the best of what your mother was supposed to be. The Lord says, you will, you will, he's ransoming it. The Lord says, I will ransom the attributes and characteristics of your family and by fourfold, give them back to you. And fourfold, you will have it as an inheritance. And fourfold, you will have everything that you should have had through your mother and father's line. Yeah, look at the line all the way out. Show them. Show them what the Lord is doing. Come on, I know it's the same on Long Island. Come on, we got a few more minutes till next service. Wow. If you're still in your seat right now, Randall, I got the clothes, by the way. Just help, pray, tell Randall, Pastor Randall, go pray for people. All hands on deck right now because I'm trying not to cry because once I start crying, I'm an ugly cry. But we made, look at, this is the living room. And the Lord said, bring the sons and daughters into the living room and let them experience the healing that they've been needing for so long. And that's what today is. Bring the kids in the living room in Indiana. Long Island, New York City, Miami, Bakersfield, Hawaii. Bring them into the living room and let them get healed. That's what this is. If you're sitting next to your family or your friends and you're not up at the altar, can you just grab their hands right now? Can you grab their hands? Grab their hands right now. Grab their hands right now. If you're with a family member, if you're with friends, just grab them by the hand real quick. Now listen, I know this might make some of you feel uncomfortable because isolation is normal to you, but I am not going to let that spirit of depression and isolation win right now. You are not alone. You are not alone. You don't have to deal with it alone. You don't have to suffer in silence. The Lord is freeing you right now. And oh, your brother might not be the same color as you. Your sister might not be the same color as you. But we are one. There is no longer Jew nor Gentile, slave nor free, male nor female. But there is one in Christ Jesus. And they might, you might be wearing a suit and they might be wearing a sweatsuit. But you are one in Christ. And we are better together. And in this living room, we don't have sibling rivalries. In this living room, we don't have sibling rivalries. In this living room, we have a house of healing. We we have a house of hope. 
We have a house where there's a future in this house. 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 In this house, we multiply family. In this house, we celebrate family. In this house, we encourage each other. In this house, we lift each other up. In this house, we have more than enough. There's no lack in this house. There's no poverty in this house. There's no backbiting in this house. This is a house of freedom all around the world. Come on, somebody. As you're holding their hand right now, I want to pray over all of you. Something shifting, something shifting in the, in the history of V1 Church. Something is shifting in the history, in the history of V1 Church. I'm talking to the young men, young men band together. Mighty men of valor, I'm calling you forth at every V1 campus. Free Women Collective. I'm calling all the women, band together. We need each other in this hour. Come on, he's healing our house. He's healing all of us. I'm talking to the youth, V1 youth all around the US and around the world. We need each other. Band together, teenagers. We need each other. I'm calling the generals. I'm calling the older generation. We need you. Don't leave. Don't back down. Older generation. We need you. We need you. V1 kids, if you can hear me, we need you. Come on, the prophet Joel said in, in the last days, he'll pour out his spirit among all flesh. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. So much healing is happening. I wanna pray right now over every single one of you. And then we're gonna sing this song and just give you a little bit of time before we transition to the next service. Right before I say this last prayer, if you're not receiving prayer right now, I want to say this explicitly to you. And I'm trying to look some of you actually in your eyes while I say it. I watched you at the beginning of this service struggle with a bitter root. I could discern it by the Spirit. I saw it in you. I saw you struggle with it through the sermon. But I watched you decide I will not hold on to this root. Come on, you right here in the black hoodie. I'm proud of you. What you did took courage. What you did took boldness. It was a big deal what you did. There's many of you, I watched you say, I don't wanna be like that, God. I don't wanna be bitter. The Bible says to come into this kingdom, you must be born again. You must become like a child. And some of you said, I don't want to pretend to be in charge anymore. I don't want to always be the parent. I want the heavenly father to be my father. And I want to be changed. And I am proud of you. Deep, deep, deep healing happened today. I'm proud of you for saying, I'm not going to be like that. So we're gonna leave the altars open. If you're in this line, you keep coming this way. There's more prayer team members, just keep sending them. We got just keep sending them, keep sending them. Let me pray over everyone, Heavenly Father. <laughs> you were rejected so that we could become accepted. You were forsaken so that we could be forgiven. You were tempted in every way so that we could be free from temptation. And Father, I thank you for this house. I thank you that in V1 Church, we don't have to remain. We don't have to stay the way that we were. That we're gonna prophesy over each other, that we're gonna call each other higher, that we're gonna encourage each other, that we're gonna lift each other up. And I don't know who I need to say this to, but. I feel like there's this lie from the enemy that keeps saying you don't belong, you don't fit. And can I tell you the truth? You do. And I don't want you to be like me. I want you to be like him. I don't want you to be like anybody on this day. I, I don't know who I need to say this to, but this, this, you belong here. And we want you to be you. We want you to be the true you. The you without the wounds and without the pain and the bitter root 
the true you. Oh, they don't need me. Oh, no, can I tell you the truth? We do need you. We do need you. Because I can't reach everybody. Our pastors can't reach everybody. But there's something about your face. There's something about your testimony. There's something about your story. It has a place in the house of God. I sent out almost 2,000 texts last night inviting people to church. And there was a 60-something-year-old woman from Northwest Indiana who texted me back. And she said, well, Pastor Mike, I love you, but I've decided I'm never going back to church again. And my heart just shattered into a million pieces because I understand every single reason why she would never come back to church. But those aren't the reasons why you don't come back. Those are the reasons why you come and you say, I'm going to be the solution to the problems I see. And we're going to build this thing together to be a house of hope and a house of healing for the nations. And maybe that woman's tuning online right now. Maybe she'll hear this message. Don't forsake the gathering of the brethren. As the time of Christ's return grows nearer and nearer, meet with us more and more frequently. Those are the words of the apostle. Because when I see what I'm seeing right now with all these tears, all this freedom, where else is this going to happen? I don't even know if the crowd mics can pick up on what my ears are hearing right now, but I hear sons and daughters just weeping before the Lord as they get free. There's no amount of money. It'll always be worth it. I'll do whatever I can to open the doors across America every Sunday so this can happen over and over and over again. My favorite, I'm going to leave you on this note. I'm going to dismiss you. My favorite thing about the kids play was actually looking at your children and saying, because their mom and dad made a different choice, they'll never have to know the things that they knew. I see our church strengthening in each generation. I see it, guys, because we're willing to do the hard work. So here's what I want you to do. I'm gonna pray you out tonight. So much of that trauma and that living PTSD was released from your body. Mark this preacher's words. You're gonna have one of the best night's sleep you've ever had in your life. You're gonna lay your head down on the pillow and there's gonna be a peace that surpasses all understanding because you're gonna lay your head down and you're gonna say, it's over. The bitterness, the resentment, the unforgiveness, the isolation, it's over. Is it perfect? No, it's not perfect till heaven, but it's over right now. So let me pray over each and every one of you. Your souls are coming to rest. Come on, just experience the peace of God with me. Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us as we forgive those who trespass against us. Deliver us from the evil one. For thine is the kingdom and the glory and the power forever. Do you feel the glory of the Lord settling into our space right now? Do you feel it settling in? The glory of the Lord. And guess what? He's got a present waiting for you when you get home. It's his presence. <laughs> He's going to meet you when you're there. Some of you are like, well, what about when I go home? The Lord says, when you came to my house, I came to yours. When you dealt with my business, I dealt with yours. I've already waited for, I'm already going to meet you there. So V1 Church, I love you so much. Part three 
is going to be amazing. I can't wait to see you next Sunday. I love you guys so much. Thank you for letting me take you on this journey. Thank you for letting me preach to you. Oh, you guys are so generous. Clap in your hands. Thank you, though, so much, guys. I love you. Next week, we'll try to go shorter for service. Go out and eat a burrito on my behalf. Eat a whole pizza. Love you guys. Be blessed.